Well, hey, Farm Life family, it's Brent Adams, host of Inside Farm Life, and I'm back with another episode of Inside Farm Life. And this week we hear from Rachel Pettit, who is a program manager with the Farmer Veteran Coalition. And recently they gave out more than 100 grants to U.S. military veterans who are transitioning to a career in agriculture. They're doing some really innovative stuff from coast to coast, and you're going to want to hear all about that and then we hear about hurricane season. Listen up if you're in the southeast or the south. Uh, the USDA brings some really valuable information by way of meteorologist Brad Rippey and uh, Gary Crawford with the USDA News Service. So uh, we're glad to bring that to you. Also, we talk about some weather-related selling in the markets with Jesse Allen on this week's Market Talk Report. Then our buddy, the Hot Rod Farmer, Ray Bohax, is talking tires in this week's Bushels and Cents. And if all that isn't enough, then we bring in the music of Allie Colleen. She's a great singer and songwriter out of Nashville by way of Owasso, Oklahoma, doing big things, getting a lot of national press. She dropped a new single here last week. We've got it right here for you on Inside Farm Life. She also has a new album out, so you're going to want to check that out. You can find out more about her at Allie Colleen Music. Dot com. We're going to try to get her on a live stream or a taping here from Nashville in the coming weeks as we get going here. But wanted to bring that music to you when it was hot and fresh. And speaking of everything we've got going on behind the scenes here, we're working on the new website that will be launched here in the coming weeks, the podcast, some more live streams. And we have the Farm Life Farm Show every Wednesday with Brandon Deal. We've got a lot going on these days. We're trying to build up uh, throughout the summer to get ready for these farm shows in the fall and winter and the conferences and conventions. We're going to bring you wall-to-wall -wall coverage of a lot of them, and you're going to be seeing a lot of us at those shows. So hope you stay tuned for that. If you haven't already done so, go to Facebook and like the Farm Life page and the Farm Life group. Keep liking, sharing, commenting. That's how we continue to grow this thing. We thank you so much for all you do to that and we really are trying to build the largest farm family on the planet and we can't do it without you so thank you so much uh, for all that you're doing there and we're going to continue to keep cranking out the content and uh, doing the best in coverage here in agriculture and also true country music well i'm going to get on out of here we got a busy week this week as we prepare for this week's show i'll be back with you again on friday with that but for now, it's Brent Adams, Inside Farm Life, and I'm out. Welcome to Inside Farm Life, your weekly connection to agriculture newsmakers, hot button industry issues, educational features, and the best in true country music. I'm your host, Brent Adams, and I thank you for giving us some of your time this week. Later, we'll hear about grants that will help U.S. military veterans embark on careers in farming and ranching, and we'll hear the music of Allie Colleen. But first, we start off with some news. The values and prices for agricultural land continue to rise. Gary Crawford tells us more. Back in January, Randy Dickhoot, who is vice president of real estate operations at Farmers National Company in Omaha, gave us his prediction for what ag land values would do this year. Steady to somewhat firmer land values in 2021. Uh huh. And Randy, has your prediction held up halfway into uh, 2021? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's okay. It's good to be right. And in fact, you say average prices of ag land are up 5 to maybe 15% over last year. One reason, there just hasn't been that much land out there for sale. It's just a tighter market, and so that definitely is helping prop up the price of what gets sold. And he says what does come up for sales being uh, sold quickly. Because of the aggressive bidding and buying and interest in owning farmland by not only farmers and ranchers, but also individuals and some investment funds. Randy expects more land to be up for sale in the next few months as landowners try to take advantage of what looks to be a seller's market in ag land. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Dick Hoot, Senior Vice President of Real Estate Operations for Farmers National Company, has one piece of advice for potential sellers of agricultural land. Right now, if you're selling land, you want to be sure it's fully exposed to the market in uh, competitive bidding uh, because there are uh, interested buyers who are willing to bid up for land right now. The USDA's Defend the Flock Biosecurity Awareness Campaign has added outreach to new and young poultry producers to promote disease protection for the nation's flocks. Ron Bain reports. USDA's Defend the Flock campaign has expanded the outreach of its message of practicing biosecurity measures to prevent disease within the nation's poultry industry and backyard flocks. The resources of the Defend the Flock program are available for youth and student audiences and their leaders. Julie Gauthier of the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service says the hashtag 
Pride Flock Defender Outreach specifically targets both younger and new poultry growers with key biosecurity practices and messages. Anytime that we have young people who are interested in poultry gathering and with their adult leaders, these materials would be ideal for them to share their interests and learn new skills of keeping their poultry healthy. She also notes the timeliness of the message to fortify biosecurity efforts as highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks are currently reported in parts of Europe and Asia. More information about the Defend the Flock campaign can be found online at www.aphis.usda.gov slash animal health slash defend the flock. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Gauthier of the Animal and Plant Inspection Service offers biosecurity tips for use by poultry producers of all sizes and levels of experience to defend their flocks from disease. The first would be choose new birds from the National Poultry Improvement Plan participating flocks. The other is to quarantine any new birds for at least 30 days before introducing them to an existing flock. And it's really important to clean equipment such as coops and cages in between birds birds and jobs. Don't share equipment with other poultry owners. That's very important. We suggest dedicating a set of clothing and boots to poultry chores and washing your hands and changing into clean clothes after taking care of your poultry. And then another advanced tip is to designate a line of separation between your flock and the rest of the world. And you create the rules for crossing that line to help prevent disease from getting into your flock or leaving it to spread to other flocks. And also this week, farmers who have insured their 2021 crops and who have planted cover crops may be eligible for a little help on their crop insurance premium bill. Gary Crawford explains. Historically, crop insurance has always played a role in in helping to foster climate smart agriculture practices. Including cover crops and the acting administrator of USDA's Risk Management Agency, Richard Flournoy, says that connection is a little stronger this season because of what's called the pandemic cover crop program. The program is really a part of the USDA's Pandemic Assistance for Producers Initiative. The assistance in this case, a $5 an acre crop insurance premium discount for those producers who insured their spring crops uh, with most insurance policies and then planted a qualifying cover crop during the 2021 crop year. Of course, it costs money for a producer to put in a cover crop. So this additional benefit for those who have planted cover crops, we feel will help reduce the cost of crop insurance for those producers. And encourage more use of cover crops. But time is of the essence here. Flournoy says if you qualify for this program, you have to report your cover crop acreage to your Farm Service Agency office by June 15. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Many companies promise increased yields and a higher return on investment, but again and again, results show that one company stands apart from the rest. Concept Agritech delivers innovative concepts utilizing the latest technologies in agronomy, biology, and chemistry to enhance soil and plant health with seed treatment, planter applied fertilizers, foliar fertilizers, and full season soil treatment solutions. To find out how to put Concept Agritech to work for you, visit conceptagritech.com. Concept Agritech technology where you need it most. Well, next up on Inside Farm Life, for the past 12 years, the Farmer Veteran Coalition has worked tirelessly to create opportunities for U.S. military veterans to find their niche in agriculture, and that involves providing startup capital to help veterans launch farming or ranching operations. And recently, the organization announced the recipients of more than 100 grants given through the Farmer Veteran Fellowship Fund. So today I wanted to welcome in Rachel Pettit, who's the manager of the Farmer Veteran Fellowship Fund. And Rachel, welcome in to Inside Farm Life. Thanks, Brent. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So over the past 11 years, more than 700 veterans have benefited from more than $3.5 million worth of equipment distributed. Tell us a bit about how the fund works. Yeah, so the fellowship program is one of Farmer Veteran Coalition's biggest programs. Every winter we open an application to all F VC members to apply for between one and five thousand dollar grant to purchase farm equipment. So um, any farmer veteran coalition veteran member is eligible to apply. We open the application online and it requires a business plan. So we help people throughout the year to form those business plans that they can submit with their application. And then the application closes around February or March and By the spring, we're awarding people. Um, This year we have 128 awardees. So we're purchasing farm equipment through the spring and summer for folks so they can get what they need in their new business. And when we talk about equipment, it really runs the gamut from greenhouses and grow tents to walk-in coolers and storage units and milking systems to honey extractors and on and on. You even had requests this year to help fund a mushroom substrate steamer 
and a lavender bud stripper. So some really interesting requests, but some people doing some really fascinating work out there. Yeah, we've had some um, great equipment. Um, one of the ones that I love to talk about is a the only veteran owned chocolate company that's American made. There's some growers in Hawaii that are two veterans working together growing cacao and they make a from bean to bar chocolate that's um, all veteran grown and we purchased an ATV for them to clear some land on the big island of Hawaii so they could plant all that cacao. So we've worked with uh, cacao growers in Hawaii, cattle ranchers in Alaska. Um, we have a flower grower in Alaska that's so remote that the only way to get to their farm is by seaplane, and they take that seaplane to the farmer's market every week. Um, they are the ro most remote farm in the United States. So we're working with a real diversity of operations. So let's break down this 2021 class of fellows. They represent nearly 40 states from Alaska to Maine and even Guam. How do they find out about the program? Good question. Yes. So we have a big following on social media, actually. And if you look at the Farmer Veteran Coalition's Facebook or Instagram or on our website, we also have an email a newsletter that goes out once a month. And we do a great job of announcing when the application is opening so people can um, hear about the opportunity to apply. We um, we advertise with a lot of different partner organizations around the country. We we have the word coalition in our name for a reason. So we're really in, interested in allyship and working with other organizations that support veterans and farmers and that intersection of farmer veterans. So together, our network helps promote this opportunity. Of this year's recipients, 47 are women, which doubles the percentage of female awardees from prior years. Tell us about the group of women and the types of roles they play in these farming operations. Yeah, we're seeing a huge increase in the United States in women-owned ag businesses, which is very exciting. In my county, in San Diego County, in Southern California, there are more women-owned farm businesses than male owned farm businesses. So this is a growing trend and that's reflected in our group of fellowship recipients. Additionally, we received support from Wounded Warrior Project this year and they encouraged us to select 50% of the awardees for their funding went to women post 9-11 injured, ill or wounded veteran farmers. So that was a great group of people that we got to support. Um, we we often see that women veteran farmers are married to another veteran farmer and those businesses that we support are extra special because one fellowship award can support two veterans on one farming operation. And um, we have many couples where the women have held down the farm if their partner is still active duty and is sometimes deployed. In fact, we've worked with someone to modify some equipment so that some of the heavy equipment was manageable by um, the female part of the business partnership um, because her husband was um, pretty suddenly deployed. And so she needed to quickly modify the equipment to take on all of the tasks that traditionally he would have done to operate some of that equipment. And Farmer Veteran Coalition was able to step in and support that transition. And to give a quick breakdown by branch of service, 52% served in the Army, 18% in the Marines, 17% in the Air Force, 11% in the Navy, and 2% in the Coast Guard. So all branches of service are pretty well represented here. Yes, we're very proud to be able to support every single branch. And um, in each year of the fellowship recipients in, and also in our membership at large, our 30,000 farmer veteran members across the nation, we see a similar breakdown where by far um, the biggest branch represented is the Army, which is reflective of the military in our country. And as you kind of alluded to earlier, none of this would be possible without the help of some very generous sponsors who have a heart for supporting those who have dedicated a portion of their lives to defending the freedom of our great country. And some of those include the Kubota Tractor Corporation, Tractor Supply Company, again, Wounded Warrior Project, Farm Credit, Tartar USA, Homestead Implements, Vital Farms, and even other farmer veterans. And one of the coolest aspects of this is that now you're seeing this program come full circle, and some of the original grant recipients are now starting to support veterans and, and who are just starting out in agriculture, not only helping to fund grants, but also to provide valuable mentorship. Yes, definitely. We're so just in awe of the generosity of our members. They are 
throughout the year helping each other with mentoring. We have a Facebook group for our members to discuss farming um, operations together and people are always willing to support, help out, lend equipment, offer advice, get on the phone. It's really amazing to see. And this year with the fellowship program, it was taken to the next step with three previous recipients turning around and donating to the fund this year. And we are just so honored to have them. And we should mention that the Farmer Veteran Coalition recently had a membership explosion after it was highlighted by the U.S. Office of Veterans Affairs. You picked up 1,300 new members in a 24-hour span. That's incredible. Yes, their phones were ringing off the hook a couple of weeks ago. Um, we were surprised by that article, very pleasantly surprised, and feel very thankful to the VA for that publicity because it really got our program in front of faces of veterans and active duty servicemen and women that might consider agriculture as their next opportunity. And it's great to get the information out there so that Folks know what their options are when they're separating from their military career and looking towards what their civilian life will look like. Um, so we had a huge explosion of folks that are just interested in that exploration phase of figuring out if farming is right for them. And that's what we're here for. We answer the phones. You talk to a real human being at Farmer Veteran Coalition and we're all experienced either having farmed ourselves or lots of us are veterans and we're here to answer questions or find someone who can get you the answer. And now you serve nearly 30,000 veterans turned farmers and ranchers, and the organization has been quite successful in getting millions of dollars in USA funds appropriated for farmer veterans and the groups that support them. If anyone is listening to this and believes they might qualify to become a part of the Farmer Veteran Coalition, they should go check out the organization's website, farmvetco.org. Again, farmvetco.org. There you can find a full list of the 2021 grant recipients, as well as a whole host of other resources that can help you you on your transition from military life to agriculture you can also follow them on facebook or instagram at at farmer veteran coalition and twitter at farm vet co and rachel thank you so much for taking the time to join us here today on inside farm life we hope you'll come back again and again and continue to share with us the great work being done by farmer veteran coalition thanks so much brent i'm happy to have been here <laughs> And again, we've been speaking with Rachel Pettit, the manager of the Farmer Veteran Fellowship Fund for the Farmer Veteran Coalition. Well, next up this week on Inside Farm Life, climate experts are predicting another busy and dangerous Atlantic storm season. On this special edition of Agriculture USA, Gary Crawford has the latest update on the forecast and things we can do to prepare for any weather disaster. Exactly one year ago, we heard this prediction for the then upcoming 2020 Atlantic tropical storm and hurricane season. An above normal season is most likely. And a few days ago for this season? An above normal season is most likely. Yes, the same forecast as last year. An above normal season. We can never be too prepared. Everyone can take steps now to make sure that they're prepared for this season. Coming up on this edition of Agriculture USA, a look at the forecast for this coming hurricane season and some things that we can do to prepare our homes and families for things like hurricanes, floods, and other severe weather. I'm Gary Crawford. There is a 60% chance of an above normal season and a 10% chance of a below normal season. Ben Friedman, acting chief of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, telling reporters that the chances for an active above normal hurricane season are pretty good. Chances for a relatively mild season practically nil. Putting numbers to it, he says there's a 70% chance that we'll see in the Atlantic Basin. 13 to 20 named storms, 6 to 10 will become hurricanes. This includes three to five major hurricanes. And that's almost exactly what had been forecast for 2020. It's very, very similar. Yes, Agriculture Department meteorologist Brad Rippey. Now that forecast being the same as was made last year, that's worrisome because, of course, last season was far worse than predicted. We ended up with an all-time record, 30 named storms. We also set records in 2020 for the number of named storms to hit the United States, 12. Damage caused by those storms well in excess of $40 billion. Worse, more than 430 deaths attributed to those storms. Now, Matt Rosencrans with the Climate Prediction Center did tell reporters... We do not expect the 2021 hurricane season 
to be as active as 2020. And USDA's Brad Rippey says the probable reason for that statement? This year we do not have La Nina. However, Brad says everything else that was associated with last year's very active, deadly hurricane season is right back with us again this year. First, very warm Atlantic Ocean surface water temperatures. That has been a hallmark of the active hurricane seasons that have been going on since the mid-1990s. Also expected this year is that we have weak trade winds across the formation zone. That means there aren't strong winds to tear apart hurricanes. Also across the Atlantic, off the coast of West Africa, there are very active, strong monsoon storms. Those are often the breeding grounds for what become tropical storms or hurricanes as they march westward across the Atlantic. Now, the official hurricane season began on June 1st, goes through the end of November, and as you heard, the conditions are right for what could be another bad season. So, the advice to folks in any storm-prone area... Take steps now to make sure that they're prepared for this season. That's Deanne Criswell. She runs the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, which itself is gearing up for what could be another nasty storm season. Well, next up on Inside Farm Life, we have an interesting phenomenon going on in the markets right Right now, and Jesse Allen is here to fill us in in this week's Market Talk update. Jesse. And thank you very much, Brent, for having me back for another Market Talk update here on Inside Farm Life this week. As we take a look here, getting into the month of June, it's an interesting dynamic right now in the grain markets. We don't normally trade a weather market this early in the growing season. We'll see a few weather factors thrown in, but normally we don't trade a weather market this heavily this early. Mike Zuzalo of Global Commodity Analytics was my guest on Market Talk this last Wednesday, and I asked him his thoughts on why the grain markets are trading a weather market this early in the growing season, because it's an interesting dynamic. Here's what Mike had to say. Yeah, and, and a couple things. Uh, I think what I'm looking at very early on this month, Jesse, is maybe a very similar pattern in terms of trade sentiment and psychology as what we saw in May, where the first half of May, we came in trading weather and supply. And the trade really didn't look much at demand. They pushed it back onto the back burner because of the weather issues that we were dealing with. Second half of May, however, especially the last week and week and a half, uh, the demand market came roaring back as a front burner top uh, tier issue mainly because China wanting to work down prices because of some policy shifts that they were putting in place, not only affecting copper, iron ore, but also ag commodities and specifically corn. I'm not so sure that we won't see kind of a similar type pattern where the trade is very uncomfortable. Again, led by the spring wheat country, Fargo, North Dakota is going to get up to 101 degrees the next couple of days. The rains, the models forecasted last week did not appear to happen. And we've still got a very large swath of the United States crop belt, maybe not the primary corn belt, but the crop belt in in a very dire situation very early on. And that's why I think June could be as much in the first half a weather market as much as May was. One other thing I would say, and, and as a side note, I'll say the European model is just not being nearly as generous about the Northern Plains getting rains the next seven days as the GFS model is at this point in time. So we may be right back on the hunt for trying to break through $8 Minneapolis or spring wheat futures uh, as we get into the end of this week or the beginning of next week on the idea that crop conditions will fall even more unexpectedly more in spring wheat next Monday. I think the other thing that came into play here um, that it probably is gonna come into play in the month of June is the WASD report And I I gotta tell you, Jesse, I think we're just beginning on what China may try to do to work these prices lower. Um, They're working very hard, changing physically and literally changing their government policy on their currencies. They've widened their currency band to weaken it against the US dollar because it just made a three year high against the US dollar. And then just in the overnight markets, uh, they've changed some of their lending facilities so that it would uh, try and weaken Uh, the currency, uh, the Chinese yuan by speculators not wanting to buy it as aggressively as they've been buying. So don't expect, one thing you take away from today's interview, in my opinion, is don't expect China to walk away and stop trying to break these markets down. And and let's be real honest with one another here uh, in these kind of markets. Look, 
I've never heard anybody say when they got back from the grocery store, well, my steak was just too low a priced. I'm really ticked off. Look, governments want cheap food policies because consumers demand it. And we have to really remember that. So three months ago, we talked about selling to Fen. We talked about selling on the way up. I'm in no different situation thinking that the first half of this month will be the weather supply side. Second half, if the weather goes away and the WASDE report doesn't give us any kind of fuel, uh, then we come swinging back around to the demand side. Also, as Mike Zuzalo alluded to, we have the June WASDE report coming up here this week. Typically, USDA doesn't make too many changes in that report, but it feels like this market is waiting on more surprises from the USDA when it comes to this June WASDE report. Here's what Mike had to say, uh, his thoughts on whether or not we could see surprises in the June report. I think we've got a world stocks to use ratio to maybe throw up as we talk about this, Jesse, because Brazil is going to be the leading candidate to bring the stocks to use level down from the current 25%. Where that red star is, is where I think we're heading towards if we have any weather issues at all. We're a long way away from a 179 and a half yield in the United States corn right now. I think a long way away, and I don't think we're much higher than last year's 172, maybe a bushel, maybe two bushels, but everybody's talking about acres right now going up, and that's fine, but we also have to put down the most important element, and that is the the yield number. And again, that's comments with Mike Zuzalo of Global Commodity Analytics. You could find more online by going to markettalkag.com or searching your favorite streaming sources for the latest episodes of Market Talk. This has been a Market Talk update for Inside Farm Life in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Jesse Allen reporting. And you can find Jesse's daily market updates at markettalkag.com. Again, markettalkag.com. And you can find him by searching Market Talk on Facebook. He also appears on the American Ag Network, and you can hear him host Your Ag Today, weekday mornings about 6.50 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Satellite Radio, Rural Radio Channel 147. Well, next up on Inside Farm Life, is it time to buy new tires for your farm equipment or personal vehicle? In this week's installment of Bushels and Cents, the hot rod farmer Ray Bohax says it's buyer beware. Welcome to Bushels and Cents on Farm Machinery Digest Radio, heard exclusively on Sirius XM Channel 147 Rural Radio. I am your host, Ray Bohax, the hot rod farmer. And never forget, it is not what you make, but what you keep that counts. When getting ready to invest in new tires for a road or farm vehicle, make sure you check all the manufacturing date codes before any funds exchange hands. The DOT mandates that every tire has a date stamp identifying when it was made. Most farm tire manufacturers do the same thing, though not mandated by law. It will be a four-digit number such as 0321. The first two digits are the week, and the last two are the year, the third week of 2021 in the example. Agriculture runs on machinery, profits on reliability. Visit FarmMachineryDigest.com, where steel and soil meet. And don't forget, you can check out all of Ray Hacks' great multimedia content at FarmMachineryDigest.com. And he's launched Farm Machinery Digest Radio on Sirius XM Rural Radio Channel 147. It airs each Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern and again on Sundays at 6 p.m. Eastern. So I hope you'll go and give him a listen. Well, with the business out of the way, now it's time to take things back to the country. And this week, we feature a singer-songwriter out of Nashville by way of Oklahoma. She's blazing a real trail for herself, and recently she dropped her debut album, Stones. Here's a cut from that album. This is Playing House on Inside Farm Life.
And that was Allie Colleen with Playing House. And you can find out more about her at AllieColleenMusic.com. Well, that's all the time we have for this week, friends and neighbors. For now, it's Brent Adams. Let's meet up here again next week. And hey, bring along a friend. You've been listening to Inside Farm Life, a production of Farm Life Media. If you have topic suggestions for future episodes, drop us a line at brent at farmlifemedia.com. And be sure to like the Farm Life page and join the Farm Life group on Facebook.